This is Coda Radio, episode 360, for June 3rd, 2019. Hello and welcome to Coda Radio, Jupiter Broadcasting's weekly talk show that takes a pragmatic look at the art and business of software development and related technologies. My name is Wes, and I'm pleased to be joined on this day of WWDC by the one, the only, Mr. Michael Dominic, who I know is all riled up. Welcome, Mike. Thank you, Wes. I am. And how are you on this holiest of days in the year? You know, actually, uh, I'm doing great. WWC has been a lot of fun to watch. I mean, we're it's, it's still going on right now as we're live. That's right. So we're missing a bit of it. But as I was preparing for today's show, I got to tune in. And while I do not currently own any Apple devices whatsoever, it's still it's still just kind of fascinating. It shows a lot about like the state of the industry and then where they're going. Plus, they've had some some big announcements today. Oh yeah, big as in huge. But before we get there, I mean, there's some some other stuff to cover. We don't want that to eat the whole darn show today. Of course not. And before any of that news came out, I noticed um, from some of your tweets, I've I've inferred that you've kind of been, you've been struggling with a machine of yours that we're all a little disappointed you've had to fight so much with. Yeah, so um, sadness. If you check out DominicM.com, and I'll throw it in the doc, you'll see that I have been uh, battling my System76 Thalios, fairly aggressive fan noise. And when I say aggressive, I you know, I got to the point of downloading a decibel monitor and actually like putting my hand next to the machine or like putting it on top and measuring it in all different ways. I was hitting the high 40s to low 50s in decibels at idle, meaning nothing running, just like sitting there on, you know, your GNOME desktop. Oh, that is, that is loud. Right. So all the measurements I'm, I'm, going to bring out here except for one are idle so not spinning up chrome not like doing the show not compiling code right idle and it's really a shame because i i like the thaleo it's such a beautiful tower in my opinion i know i know the wood is a little controversial but i like it um that it was just untenable for me to use it to do the show and basically like conference calls which i have four or five times a week yeah, that's kind of important when you're talking to your, your clients and possibly employees. Right. So especially now that we're fully remote, it, it's kind of just not okay for me not to be able to get a clear call through. So I, I ended up on Reddit and a bunch of forums basically digging through this problem. And it turns out, because my first thought is, of course, you know, I had this problem a while ago and I just ignored it because I was using the Thaleo for other stuff. And I thought, well, maybe mine's defective, right? Like maybe there's something weird. Mm-hmm. This one needs to be tweaked, whatever. That's not the case? Right. No, that's not the case. There's a whole pile of people complaining about it. Even po- positive reviews of it mention the fan noise. Even my original review of it mentioned fan noise. Um, obviously, I think some people might be able to tolerate it a little better than I can. Part of it is because, you know, as you know, we're working on sound quality for all the shows, right? So having a giant fan behind you is not great. Right. And this wasn't just the level you, you were provided behind the scenes. You'd provide some samples that we were all taking a look at. Yeah, we, we were all working on it in Slack. And it was it was pretty remarkably like you had to you had to do a lot even to get it to the sort of acceptable phase, honestly. Yeah. So I ended up having to open the case and rewire the. Uh, so there's two fans. Technically, there's three because there's a GPU fan, but I didn't mess with that one. There's an intake fan at the bottom. Uh, there's the GPU fans. and But the two fans we care about are that intake one at the bottom of the case and the CPU fan, which is like, if you're looking at it, it's like at the top back, right? And it's 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 a CPU fan that you would expect to see. Mm, right. Um, so I'm very easy to open up. They did that really well. Uh, the hand screws work great. I did not have any problems. I ended up figuring out that for whatever reason with the daughter board, that custom um, FOSS board that they use, it wasn't exactly honoring my changes in the BIOS for the fan curve, right? The fan speed curve, which is set fairly aggressively. Uh, so you could go twiddle and tweak settings in the BIOS, no observable effect. Right. Which, as a Mac guy, I can tell you how happy I am to be tweaking the BIOS and opening a case. 
Oh, from, <laughs> yeah, that's what users should have to do, right? I'm, I'm already in a dark place, right? So, you know, I figure out from reading Reddit and just like tweaking and seeing other people complaining that it looks like it's all this daughter board. So if I wire it to the motherboard, it being the CPU fan, I bet it will honor the BIOS settings. Oh, so you just sort of, you just routed around, you said, this daughter board, it's not working, it's driving the fan too hard. Let's try the actual BIOS control. Well, it was either that or, you know, Drew and I were going back and forth in Slack talking about different fans I could buy. But that that's like crazy train, right? That's... Mm, yeah, that's that's even farther down the path of madness. Right, that's like just go buy a Mac Pro, right? So I did that, which was a, a fairly um, non-involved installation. I mean, I don't have the... There's Thaleo and Thaleo Major, and I think there's one above it. I have the smallest case um, and, a, and a relatively large GPU, so I did have to like remove the GPU to be able to be able to get my you know my hands in there and do everything. But you know what? Gotta love the um, industrial design. A lot of good cable management. The actual like hardware side of this, though, I don't think I should have had to do it. Was very easy. Mm, okay, so th- so it's not it's not all bad. And if you were making some other hardware swap or upgrade, that'd be a success story. But you would have preferred not to have to open that thing up at all. Right. Like after I got it open, I noticed if I want to throw another SSD in here. Man, would that be dirt simple. Like, that would be the five, ten minute job. Super simple. But this is, you know, okay, so I wire it there, go into the BIOS, and I start screwing with the settings. And it turns out I was able to get it down to about 36 decibels, which is okay. It's barely acceptable, I think, for a desktop. The big caveat here was I did not rewire the intake fan because I was concerned about too much heat, right? I only re- rewired the CPU fan. You were a little concerned. I mean, yeah, this is an expensive machine and you don't want to have it, uh, you know, just melt down itself. Right. And the other thing is just like the, the way the way the cables run, the intake fan was just a lot harder to get to. That was going to be a much more in-depth um, operation there. So it was okay for a day or two. Then my wife, unbeknownst to me this morning, was cold. So she turned the air conditioning, because remember Florida, so it's always like 90 degrees, right? So we always run central air. Mm-hmm. So you have AC cranked just 100% of the time. Right. But she turned it down, meaning temperature higher, to 75 today. Remember, I did not touch the intake fan. Well, the intake fan felt the increase in temperature today and was right back up to about 45 by itself, even if the CPU fan didn't come on or barely came on with my new settings. Wow. So... I ended up making the decision that it wasn't worth it for us to keep us, meaning you, me, and Drew, to keep like going back and forth with sample recordings. And like, so I just disconnected the failure. Um, having said that, my fan hack does work, provided you are not already in a extremely, well, not extremely, but relatively hot ambient environment. And also, there is nothing that would stop you from rewiring the intake fan too. Um, to their credit, um, a developer named Michael at System76 did reach out on Twitter. They are very aware of this issue. Uh, the GitHub issue is linked uh, in the Twitter thread, and we can throw it in the um, in the show notes too. You know, they've known about the issue for a while. It is hard coded in the Thaleo firmware. Oh man, rough. It's it's there's no like GUI way or even like change a config file way to fix this. So you, would you have to like reflash that board or something? Well, they have to they have to patch it, right? I mean, that's that's going to be the solution. There's also some question about like what is the acceptable number. I would openly admit that most people aren't doing podcasting and tons of conference calls on a Thaleo. So I imagine maybe a lot of people are more tolerant than I would be. Mm, yeah, if you if you just have it in the corner and you're trying to churn through some renders or you know compile a big code base, maybe you don't care. Or like under your desk, right? Like if you don't have a carpeted floor, you could put it on the floor and then you probably, you know, it's fine. That'd be, yeah, block some of the noise at least. So I don't know, right? Like it is a, you know, as I wrote in my post, it's it's a premium price product. I mean, that's not great. I, I hope they fix it. Right. That, that um, PR you linked to did look like they were actively investigated and even prepared something that might have worked for your issue. It's just... You know, it's it's not in the pipeline yet, and who knows when you'd actually be able to go get that applied to your machine. I don't even. I mean, I don't know what the. Do they have? I know they have their firmware updater, so maybe it just rolls out that way. 
Yeah, I think it just rolls out. I think I think ideally it would roll out through the firmware updater. I think that's how actually they do it for them all of them. Because uh, there was an issue with the Galagos about a year ago where that sadly did it just through the firmware updater. Right. Yeah. So if they can actually if they can actually get there, that'll be good. But it seems like it's taken a long time um, for this much information to really be available. And now that it's out and you can see sort of the open review process on GitHub. That speaks a lot to kind of the point of this board, right? Like they wanted to have this open firmware custom board so that instead of having to get, you know, secret code from the motherboard manufacturers to control the fan stuff, they could do it all in, in open source and with their own custom stuff that could be modified. It seems like we're just a little early in that process where it doesn't work great for the end user. Now, maybe down the line that can change and it is out, out in the open, so there's probably some room there. Still early days. Yeah, still early days. I mean, this is their first you know, self 100% manufactured piece of hardware. Um, I don't think as problems go, this is the worst problem you could have. And I'm, I will be shocked if it's not tweakable via firmware update. Um, since, you know, the fan curve is again, currently hard coded in the daughter board. So really just make a little gnome utility that I can change that and life is great. Um, so ask me what solution I ended up going with that I'm talking to you on right now. I was going to say, you, your, your fan noise doesn't sound bad at all today. Hmm, I'm, I'm a little suspicious that it might have something to do uh, with, with Apple. Wrong. What are you using? I am using the Galago Pro with an eGPU. Is that right? Okay. Yeah. Mm, what, what, um, what GPU do you have in your eGPU setup? Oh, geez, we did an episode on it a few weeks ago. Um, it is the Radeon Sapphire MX, or yeah, 560, I think. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, in the OWC case, it's the Apple recommended one that connects via Thunderbolt. Um, I am very ironically for something we're going to talk about later today, Wes. I think I'm bought in on the eGPU lifestyle now. Yeah, I'm getting really tempted. And uh, part of me wants to build a big new honkin' Linux desktop. Another part of me wants to get something a little smaller and just go the eGPU route because I, I have this other, you know, I have a ThinkPad that I could use with it too. It just seems like an affordable choice that's working decently enough if you're all right with tinkering yeah and it's not that much tinkering really even on linux there's just like a little i think i, I think you linked it a couple weeks ago that i ended up using a little bash script that just sets it up the only big bug that i see on i'm running a pop 1904 so ubuntu 1904 is you cannot like hot unplug your your thunderbolt eGPU. yeah i imagine uh, your graphics card disappearing is probably an upsetting event to everything depending on that well mac actually handles it and so does windows <laughs> uh, well, where do you think you are, Mike? Come on. Yeah, I know. Jesus. You want you want stuff to work or do you want an open source operating system? In, in the words of Leonard Pottering, you're getting this free. Stop complaining. Yeah, I got it. Yeah, oh, that's great. All right. Well, it's nice that that system is working um, and that the fan noise is an acceptable level. For, for my recording stuff, I've just had to move all my all my equipment out, out of the room, but that's not an ideal choice. That would have been much too simple. That would be much too simple. You got to fight. You want to make it a fight. That's right. I want the glory of battle. So I'm curious what you think about, let's just, let's just dive into WWDC and start with what is maybe the most exciting thing and the most relevant. The Thaleo not working out too great. You might be able to find something more to your liking in an Apple's new Mac Pro. You know, I, I really wish Chris was here so I could ask him for, uh, what is it, $6,000? Yeah, that is the starting price of this new machine. Yes, that's right. You know, it's for show. It's for show research. We need it. Yes, exactly. Linux Academy will gladly pay for it. I, I, you know, honestly, it would it'd probably make an excellent studio machine. So no, actually, you know, I w I've been while we were getting ready, I was kind of looking into the the um, the verge right up of it in the specs. Not many developers are not going to need this machine. This does sound like kind of a audio production, um, particularly video production unit. Yeah, they're like we uh, we heard you're disappointed. We haven't made a. Uh you know, media workstation. So we are going hard at making a media workstation. Like super hard. Like I like it. I mean, Wes, I got to be honest. If if I did not, on a whim, start the eGPU Kool Aid, I would probably be saving up for the next ten years to buy one of these. Yeah, that is a that's a big investment. Plus, what do you still you still need to buy their new fancy new screen at the same time? I'm sure you can reuse the screen you have, but yeah, that's just not the Apple way. It's just not the Apple way. Um, was there anything about the Mac Pro that stood out? I mean, first of all, it's not like some stupid shape, right? We should say that it is a tower, effectively. It looks like a, I mean, just a fancy high end machine. Yeah, you could recognize that it. Oh, that's a computer. Yeah, okay. It's like it's like something you would buy in like Newegg, right? Like if buy for a custom case. Mm. Um, it looks nice. It 
looks very much like the old cheese grater Mac Pro, which is what people want. Yeah, I like that callback. It's nice, yeah. It is massive overkill for all but the highest end of developers, I would say. Yes, this is not, you know, I mean, I think many people are willing, maybe not pleased, but willing to spend somewhere between, you know, $1,500 and $3,000 on a, on a nice workstation for something that just should last a couple of years and, uh, you know, has has decent graphics and nice peripherals and all that. This is not in that box at all. It really is like, you're a serious professional. This is coming out of some business line budget somewhere because it's going to be, you know, it's going to be your main production tool. And if that's true, it seems awesome. Like, um, I've known a few shops that have played around with buying, you know, like custom rigs designed for machine learning data science applications, which is boxes rigged with GPUs so that you can, you know, train and test, evaluate models faster right there on your desktop and not have to push it off to some cluster. Um, for that space, this seems very competitive, right? And I'm sure of the people working on stuff like uh, like ARKit, etc., these would be great machines for that internally, too. I, kind of. So you don't even need that much for ARKit. I mean, like the MacBook Pro that I have, the i9 with the uh, Radeon, or, or hell, a Mac Mini with the eGPU I have, will, will do you just fine on ARKit. Um, but c- there's a little dirty. Can I give you some inside baseball? Yeah, please do. If you are a independent Apple developer and you have a business account, you should not buy this. You can actually just lease them and they're much more affordable. You do like a three year lease. Oh yeah. What what kind of what does that look like? You end up paying less as long as you're always going to be locked into Apple. That's kind of their their Right. As long as you're committed to like continually having one of these machines around. And you cannot lease the lowest end version. Ah, yeah. Um, but they're doing that pretty aggressively with the iMac Pro, which if I wanted an iMac Pro, I would just lease it through my business and it would actually like be a much less significant purchase, in quotes. Especially the way I go through you know, what I mean, there's a whole thing. I don't want to go on my eGPU tangent, but if this works out for me, really, I'm just going to buy a new laptop every year to like upgrade, you know, memory and processor and RAM because I only have 16 gigs. Mm, yeah, and right. And you've separated stuff. You can have two different ca- upgrade cadences for your GPU system. Two two cadences, right? Yeah, that's really nice. Yeah, I mean, one disappointing thing is no Nvidia, right? I was kind of surprised by that. I, they were they were playing up the expandability, right? I mean, it's so funny to think, but it's like, we brought PCI back to the Mac, nice. um, which is ridiculous in some perspectives and nice in another perspective, right? I have never been so excited about PCI, though. I mean... <laughs> Seems like they're they're doing it right too, and Thunderbolt just sort of wired throughout the entire thing. It's um so definitely an I/O monster. Yeah, it's an impressive machine. Yeah, I don't know. I I can't imagine a day where I get to really play with one uh, up close, and that's kind of the the disappointing part. I don't need to edit or render a bunch of like native ProRes 8K. Uh, I'm sure if you do, that's that's pretty exciting. It's weird though because it seems like is this when I was listening to it, honestly, I was excited. I've I, you know I. I did kind of grow up on Macs, and so I I like them. And for a long time, they were this, right? They were the like sort of media professional designers or print or whatever industry. A Mac was like a creative person's workstation and a, PC, a computer designed for them. It felt like they were trying to harken back to that and embrace it. But at that price point, now that I think about it, it feels like maybe, does this really, it's exciting because it's new and it's great and they're clearly committed to doing it right. But it's just not for us. Yeah, I think it's a, like, so I had the same experience, right? Growing up, like, Macs were, particularly the, it, it wasn't the cheese grater. It was like the G5 tower, whatever, the G4. Oh, yeah, yeah. was like an aspirational thing for me. Mm-hmm. Back on the power PC days. Right, back in the power PC. Like, but, but, like, I could never afford a Mac, right? Like, back then, it was. Um, yeah, I think they're aspirational devices and things you will sell to Pixar. Although... You know, I could see a JB having like one, right, to just do some super high-end renders every once in a while or just crank through some video assets when you guys are on the road. The the, the sort of frustration, I guess, maybe captured a lot of this because I, I'm curious, I'm Apple curious. Actually, my very first smartphone was an iPhone, so that was my introduction to that, that world in the first place. So I spent many years on iOS. I'm not there now, but I keep looking on thinking about, you know, how do these devices fit? Do they make sense in my life? Some of the news around, let's say, like the Apple Watch becoming more of a standalone device. That's interesting because I don't have an iPhone. Maybe I will, but I I just got a Pixel 3, so I'm not going to switch this generation at least. If I could use it on its own, though, it's clearly the, the only device in its class out there, right? So there's not a lot of choices. So it's frustrating that when Apple does something, 
if you can if you can shape the ways that you want to interact with that device into the ways that they're designing for, they do it right and at like such a a level of design and thoughtfulness that no one else can touch. So it's frustrating as someone as an outsider who wants to use it doesn't quite feel like it's in the shape where it, like it, it plays with the way I use computers yet, but it's getting close. And another way that it's getting close, right, is, is iPad OS, the new sort of grown up version of iOS that's that has more iPad focused features and uh, regular old computer stuff like files and folders and SMB support. Yeah, this is um, this is probably the most exciting thing in this in this dub dub for me. Um, I really, really, really think most people working in factories and like offices and in sales and lots of places do not need computers anymore. They need like powerful tablets with, you know, to basically LTE chips, right? LTE SIM cards. Yeah, always on, just, you know, has all have all of your communication apps because that's 90% of what we're doing, right? It's sending emails, checking Slack, doing some web browsing, maybe a little bit of creative work on the side. Or like whatever, you're, you know, you're an inspector. You, and you, you can already see this actually. A lot of people do this already. But just like more powerful applications, um, I kind of think they're all going to be HTML5, a la WebAssembly pretty soon. But you do need the OS to actually support, um, you know, the tablet as a real computing device and not, you know, a content consumption device. Right. And they have branched off, right? The, the tablets are doing a lot more or at least exploring different spaces than what you can do on the limited size and shape of a phone. That, that's another area. Like, there's not another tablet that I would, that I'm really interested in. And I've I've used iPads for a long time. I'm familiar with them. And they're, I mean, they're pretty great at it. You have had to accept that Apple basically wanted to reinvent the OS and start off with their, you know, their like user faces stuff and then add in redone and reworked primitives, things like the, you know, ways that you interact with files or USB drive support that you would expect on a traditional machine, but hadn't been implemented in this new world of iOS. But it's getting closer and you can see the day and, it, you know, it'll be some straggling curve, but more and more of general purpose computing is being eaten by these devices. Yeah, I mean, and, and Apple can kind of take their time because, you know, Ubuntu Touch was never a real competitor. Android on tablets was always kind of crappy. Yeah, there is no competitor. Yeah, Windows is maybe the nearest thing, but that they're a distant second. Mm-hmm. And I don't think they can yet compete with the, for all the pains it causes power users, the rethought interaction models and like ways of, of how computing works that I think is really appealing. I um, all right. So a uh, little bit, a little bit. Personal, my my father's a bit of a luddite. He's he's not a computer forward person. He can use them as a tool, but isn't really interested in them other than that. Being disappointed in some of his local news available, um, the family got him an iPad this this Christmas as a sort of like, oh, here you know we've got like the New York Times or whatever other uh, subscriptions you want to put on there. You can have it right there. It was the first like new machine he'd used in a few years, and I don't know that many other you know a, a window a Surface or a Windows tablet it just wouldn't it wouldn't have provided the same sort of ease and clarity of the interaction model that I think let him actually be successful at using the device. I came back and visited just recently, and he was sitting there on his tablet, and then he was telling me about some hacking story reported in the New York Times. I was like, "What? Are you the same person?" Nice. And it's just because like that device is simplified and safe and lets him feel comfortable using it in a way that a more powerful machine probably wouldn't. Yeah, I think that makes a ton of sense. I mean, and also they're, you know, they're fairly easy to replace in service, right? That's a good point. You can just get a new one, you know, you, could, you can know where to where to take it. And if you're using all the iCloud stuff, then you know most of your data is going to be safe too. And you have a guaranteed configuration that you're developing to, or at least a small set of guaranteed configurations, right? Uh, so you don't have like a million different devices with... Um, you know, a million different potential pieces of hardware or settings, blah, blah, blah. So I think the last thing, well, the last two things would be Project Catalyst, which was uh, the artist formerly known as Marzipan. I don't have a lot here, Wes. It's okay, so you can bring your iPad apps to Mac. Right, that's the, that's the goal here, is you can take apps that have already been designed, is that right? So it's you have an app that's already running on iOS, and then through... I guess Project Catalyst, you can get it up and running on the Mac. Yeah, I mean, I, th I think in reality, the good um, Catalyst apps are going to be designed from the ground up. Right, that's the issue so far, is everyone seems to have a complaint that like, yeah, okay, it does run, but it, it feels like a weird ported iOS app that doesn't fit desktop paradigms. It doesn't fit with the platform, but, you know, the second thing they announced, Swift UI, which is a very React component-y way to build UI. Did you notice that? Yeah, I don't know quite how 
how declarative or along that spectrum it will be. I haven't played, gotten a chance to play with it, obviously. Um, but it did, just from the few samples and interactions that they were showing, it did feel that way, which might make it kind of kind of cool. I mean, that's always been my complaint with, with some of the more, um, you know, just old-fashioned UI sort of policies. I think that was why React took off so well, is you could just sort of say, like, here's what I want the page to be, here's how it should work, and uh, you figure it out, library. Yeah, I mean, the uh, .NET world has this. In fact, it, Xamarin it used to be very common to do your UI, your UI in declarative C-sharp, basically, which looks an awful lot like what they're doing in Swift here. So this is, I think, Apple. Um, it's pretty clear to me that Swift UI is, you know, let's say one or two reps from here going to be the UI framework. Does that mean um, Objective-C is, is over with? I mean, are we really entering the era of Swift only? We're not there yet, but I would say in a rev or two, uh, pour out your 40s and pour one out for Objective-C. Now, it's still, still, it could be possible that your, like, your logic could be written in Objective-C because they still support C++, right? Ah, uh, yes. Mm-hmm. In terms of writing UX in Objective-C, yeah, you, the, the end is nigh. You might have some, yeah, back-end libraries that you're using, but you, but the main thing that you're going to use to design the, the whole application will be Swift. It's going to be Swift, yeah. I mean, right now, Swift UI is not mandatory, but um, or it wasn't clear in the keynote if it's mandatory. It doesn't seem like it is, but I think at this point, it's it's definitely something if you're building a new, um, particularly iPad OS or, or um, I keep wanting to say Marzipan Catalyst app, uh, I I would be hard-pressed to, to not look at that. Just from the demos they showed, um, it looks very powerful, and uh, I imagine there's some performance gains in not having to load and unload nib files. Just, just my two cents. But yeah. So speaking of things that are hyper performant, Wes, I hate you. Yeah, you're a little, uh, you're a little mad at me, and I, I think in a good way though, knowing you. It's good hate. It's good hate. Uh, so Wes turned me on to Elixir as part of our seven week seven languages. Yes, I did. Maybe you could tell us a little bit about Elixir. I know we've we've mentioned on the show, but I think this is the deepest dive we've d- dared to do. Yeah, yeah. It's um, I failed to complete my GitHub assignment, of course, which but I will post something after the show. Um, I ended up digging deep into Elixir videos and Elixir tutorials, in particular to comparisons to Ruby. Um, and some performance statistics. Ah, and I'm, I'm really, one of the things I'm curious to see out of this is what you think as an experienced Rubyist of if those comparisons really make sense or if it's just sort of surface level. Yeah, well, obviously, I'm, you know, I'm not a big fan of benchmarks, but there's definitely, um, in fact, I linked to a blog post in the show notes uh, comparing Elixir and Phoenix, which is their MVC-ish web development framework um, and API development framework and Ruby and Rails, which everybody knows what Rails is. And yeah, I mean, there's some significant performance increases, and the author makes just a tremendous argument that by virtue of being functional, but also just less magical than Ruby, Elixir is not only more performant, but you have less of the issues of a gem is no longer maintained or blows up or is incompatible with some new version of some other gem. It depends on, and you have a problem. Now, to be fair to Ruby and Rails, the disadvantage is obvious. Ruby and Rails are particularly designed for developer productivity and getting things done as quickly as you can. But damn, I mean, I, I, to me, it's not really an either or. I know that's a clickbaity way to do this. Right. Yeah, yeah, of course. You have to choose the tool for the job. But, but maybe this is a new useful tool to you. Well, I think for like crunching through data for things like, um, you know, multi-channel messaging, i.e. bots, having Elixir components might make a lot of sense. Um, saving, you know, server costs, getting things done quickly, and just the guaranteed safety of being purely functional, I think is pretty pretty interesting. And its syntax is very Ruby-esque. So it was weird. As I was playing with it, it didn't feel that foreign to me. Right. And so like in comparison, they, you know, Elixir is based on Erlang, and they both run on the Beam VM, Erlang was developed out of Prolog, so you, the syntax is, if you haven't done Prolog, it's it's pretty darn wacky. So you're, you're saying you felt pretty comfortable as a new developer coming in, not, not familiar really with the platform, and just sort of getting to work. Yeah, I did. I felt like it was pretty pretty solid, pretty well-maintained. I mean, the documentation is some of the best documentation I've seen in a while. Yeah, they really. you can tell the project really cares about that, which is, I mean, that's great for bringing on you know new people into the project. Yeah, I would say the only 
somewhat downside I found is that it doesn't, and you can correct me if I'm wrong with this, it doesn't seem like it's a very popular language right now. No, I mean, the um, the Beam's always been a bit of um, of a niche, and Elixir is is pretty darn new. I mean, not really that new, but on the scale of languages, it's it's still new and growing. Um, it does seem like the community is pretty active. Um, I think it might also fall in one of the, the sort of secret weapon camp, where... You know, you might not use it at your big enterprise where you already have a Java application, but perhaps for someone with a small consultancy who has a little more choice, um, you know, like um, famously WhatsApp has been uh, based on Erlang for a long time. And so you can see how in certain applications, as long as you, you're willing to put up with, you know, having to do a little extra work training on new people to get them familiar with the language, it might make your code easier. Like, I'm, I'm curious what you thought about the, um, you know, the sort of, agent-based systems, message passing, having actors that you can use. Yeah. It, see, it all, in a weird way, it all felt very old, but also very new to me. Um, and I, to be honest, I actually bought a book on it. I'm going to be digging into it more. Oh, really? That's fantastic. Because I may actually have a practical use for this. So I don't want to talk out of my butt too much. Do we need to extend this so that you can have another week in the challenge? Well, I, 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 think, I think we don't. Um, just because I might do something a little bigger. But I, I think I'm sold on Elixir, right? If the goal was to convince me that Elixir is something worth looking into, I, you know, j- just just for example, I was reading the, basically, of this whole getting started, basically, book, right, on their website. And I read through the whole damn thing. And they very wisely assumed that the people who would be attracted to Elixir are Rubyists. So they kept comparing things to Ruby, which makes it very easy to kind of, okay, so this is, I forgot what the thing was, but this is like a Ruby, I think it was like a, uh, some kind of, pa- the way they do pattern matching differently, right? Uh, where Ruby kind of does and doesn't, but that's a whole thing. No, you know, right. I mean, pattern matching is kind of ubiquitous in the Elixir world. Right. So it's like, if you would have done this in Ruby, this is our much less code, simple, more functional way to do it, which is kind of, I got to say, I... I really am surprised I haven't heard more about it. Although I could definitely see that building anything non-trivial in this, there's got to be some kind of learning curve here. Like I just reading through it, it was like, okay, so these are some pure functional techniques here, right? This is not functional like F sharp is functional. This is really functional. Yeah, I mean, there is, um, you know, the the VM has a lot of immutability sort of baked into it. So where whereas, say, with the JVM, you can layer that on top in a more functional language, you don't really have the option. You have less escape routes, I think, uh, on the beam. It is interesting, though. I'm um, I'm curious if when you get to try some more more of the concurrency, because that seems like, in particular, an area where Ruby really struggles and Elixir really shines. Yeah, and like so does Node, right? So if you think about my use case of like chatbots for something like an Alice, that's 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 an area where I would love more help. Um, yeah, right. And the nice the advantage too, right, is that you have different um, you have different concurrency models. So with Node, you just you know you have you have this single core. Now I know I realize there's multiple core aspects you can do with with I/O and, and other aspects of it, but your your main code runs on a single core. Um, Beam is kind of unique, not really unique, but somewhat unique in that it has preemptive multitasking as well. So you have some nice guarantees in terms of. Um, you know, latencies and responses because one messed up really long task can't eat into the system in the way a cooperative multitasking system can have happen. I couldn't have said it better myself. So what did you think of, I think, the much easier assignment I gave you? (laughs) (laughs) Yes. So uh, you assigned me to TypeScript. Um, It's it's, honestly, it's been interesting. I've I've been having a lot of fun playing with it. So thank you. It was a good choice. Um, it's a bit language I've been watching, but I hadn't directly interacted with. Uh, so my first stop was over to the playground they have. And that's just like a, a little web app where you type in some TypeScript and then it'll show you the output JavaScript and then you can run it there as well. And that was sort of in lieu of a REPL. It's always funny like playing with more static languages because I'm, I'm used to trying things out and just sort of opening up a REPL and, and, and playing around and, you know, kind of trying out basic evaluations and learning a little bit of the syntax and that's just not the way. I mean, you, there is um, TS Node, which is a little uh, TypeScript REPL on top of Node. So I, I got that installed and played there too. But it was kind of fun as someone who'd used other transpiled languages just to go look and see how some of the basic constructs, like, I think it's kind of educational even for people to look at just like the basic 
class stuff, right? So like TypeScript adds types to JavaScript, but it also incorporates a lot of the newer standards and proposals and changes to JavaScript. So it just feels kind of like a better, more polished JavaScript. But I found it interesting seeing how some of those those constructs um, turn into JavaScript. And you can learn a little bit, you know, if, you, if you're not familiar with the weird prototypical inheritance structures and the way JavaScript works and how you can sort of model objects and that sort of stuff, looking at like a basic class and it's compiled code, it, it, it honestly explains a lot, which is kind of neat. Um, and you can see stuff like what what structures are purely at compile time, like interfaces, for example, in TypeScript. They don't, you know, there's no generated output. It's all just stuff that the compiler uses to better check for you. So you can tell they spent a lot of time thinking and, and designing this really well. I also went on my own TypeScript journey about a year ago. Would you write TypeScript over JavaScript? Uh, way, I know you like closure scripts, so I guess it's it's assuming you were like verboten for writing closure script, right? <laughs> right, yeah, yeah, sure, yeah. Um, so I think the problem you have with JavaScript is you sort of got to pick, you got to pick things, you got to pick which JavaScript and which tools, and you'll, you'll, you'll still have some of that with TypeScript. I mean, it's not like it's a, it totally solves all of those problems. Um, but I think it sort of is a nice standard, because worst case, right, it is just a superset of JavaScript. So you kind of get, you know, the compiler doing a bunch of the nice stuff, so you get all the modern um, standard stuff, and you can have, you know, not only will it do a, a pretty decent job of inferring types automatically for you, so you get a little bit of extra safety almost for free, and you can turn off all the, like, harsh flags if you really don't want that stuff to, you know, to prevent you from actually emitting JavaScript. Like, yeah, 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 I know. My algorithm is unsound, but I just, in practice, never hit the edge cases, then just just spit this out for me, TypeScript. Um, I think it is it is probably a pretty good choice for, you know, if you don't have a reason to stick to standard JavaScript. Um, it's well-supported. There's types for lots of libraries. And it, you know, there as they say, it's JavaScript that scales. I, I can see that being true. Um, you know, it does provide a lot of the niceties of a statically typed environment that can help sort of formalize things if you've got a diverse team with different backgrounds and different skill sets working all in the same large code base together. It seems like that would be an area where it particularly shines. It would also work, I think, for anyone who's sort of interested in this stuff but doesn't, you know, isn't comfortable going a little more off the beaten path with something like Clojure Script or Peer Script or, you know, any of the more functional or just extreme variants of, of languages that transpile the JavaScript because you get all this extra layers of type stuff and I think a big plus and a big negative for me personally is that the rest of it is the same, right? So like all the basic constructs, it's just JavaScript. So it's not a huge paradigm shift except for all the extra stuff you can do with the fancier compiler. Uh, that's not really, I, I prefer some, you know, like, functional methods of thinking. So I did do a little bit of playing around with some of the libraries available for TypeScript. Like, uh, I think it's like just FPTS, and there's one called Purify. Uh, I don't know what, what is the current study or state of the art or which is the best, but you can tell that those things, you know, people are interested in that stuff and have ported some of the ideas from, from Haskell and other more serious uh, statically typed languages. I feel roughly the same way. It, it, it almost doesn't go far enough um, for me to not just use JavaScript. Although, interesting, so given, if we throw ClojureScript back into my question from about two minutes ago, you would just go ClojureScript every day, right? Uh, yes, I think I still would. Um, I, I enjoyed using TypeScript. I was legitimately impressed with, you know, I just kind of got this, the standard VS Code sort of dev environment set up, and it's 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 really nice. And I like how flexible the type system is. Um, it's It's nice not to just have, like, the nominal sort of typing that you get with... Uh, C Sharp or Java, um, so that you can really, it feels m closer to really modeling the data and the structures of stuff so that you can easily have um, interoperability and you don't have to get obsessed with making individual types for all these little things. You can kind of play along that spectrum as you need when you have, you know, when you're in the prototyping stage and stuff's a little more flexible and then maybe you, you further refine those ideas of what types you're playing with as your system solidifies later down the path to production. Um, so for a type system, I thought it did a really good job of just not getting in the way. But I don't particularly enjoy many of the standard object-oriented approaches to modeling problems. So that's a little bit of a barrier. And it felt like I was kind of shoehorning some of those functional stuff on top. Um, so I would, I would probably try to play with ClojureScript more often or just stay in that camp. And I think it's interesting because some of the problems that these are, are solving... 
they've taken very different routes because you know TypeScript's going the all right, well, you're going to have big files, you can have multiple files, you have huge projects that are hard to keep in your head. We're going to help you by adding this this nice rigid structure of typing to help you have a more well-founded program, validate things, check your back for you. I think the closure script approach is basically to say, I mean, there is lots of stuff and we can get into that in a different episode. But the basic approach is just like let's let's have less of this, you know, like let's focus on simplicity and have a small program that you can understand and you can then avoid those same mistakes. Yeah, no, I think I think it would be great one week to do a, a deep closure script dive. Uh, you could teach us all the glory of closure script. And I'm not even kidding. It's probably, you know, I am slowly coming to your functional way of thinking. More and more, I'm just tired of managing state, basically. Yeah, and I mean, of course you have state. I think the key is just to sort of refine your interactions with it um, and reduce the ways that you can have error and sort of centralize that state. Actually, I'll, I'll provide in the show notes, um, there's a great little video um, from a recent Clojure conference all about solving problems the Clojure way. And it's not, in, the whole talk is in JavaScript, so I think it's, it's pretty approachable. And it talks to some of those things of, you know, like why, why some of these simple and functional techniques might help you reason about your code better. Couldn't have said it better myself. Okay, so we had Elixir and TypeScript. So we had one very functional language so far, right? And one language that really, really wants you to embrace the OO side of life. Is that fair? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So what are we thinking for next week? Do you want to go first or do you want me to go first? Mm, let's have you go first. Well, I'm very tempted to do Obsi just just for, as a as a funeral, but I won't because it's dumb and wasteful. Um, uh, I mean, I, I'll I'll try to venture down any path you lay forth. It, it's not worth it, and it's just not worth it because <laughs> it's yeah. I'm actually going to say Kotlin because I'm I'm honestly curious what you, as a very functional oriented guy, are going to think about Kotlin which is obviously not functional, but I, I think you might find some things you like. Mm, okay, yeah. No, that sounds great, actually. Um, I'm looking forward to that. Now for you, Mr. Dominic. Hmm. I have been, I've been wrestling with a few ideas, and I think I'm going to keep you on a little the little corner of the world you're in at the moment. But now it's your turn to get to play in the JavaScript space. So I say let's have you try Reason ML. Reason ML. Oh, I am Googling it. I actually don't know this. Reason ML is root. Okay. Okay. So what is this like that I would know? Is this a JavaScript alternative now? Yes, it is. It's um, it's a new syntax uh, basically on top of OCaml that compiles to JavaScript. Um, so where, where it has gotten a lot of adoption, it's kind of come out of Facebook. Um, a lot of the people behind React originally have been working on this. So there's even a version of React that runs on Reason. Oh my god, it works with NPM? Yeah. And they have a weird version of Mario written in it? Okay, okay. There's a lot to like about Reason ML, and there's many similarities to uh, ClojureScript, so I'm, I'm kind of using you as a guinea pig here to tell me what you think about it. Now, this looks like it runs in the browser. Yeah, it does. And I'm sure you could run it on um, uh, Node as well. I've not tried that. Yeah, I, I see it. Uh, yeah, I, I see they're running it in a Node app here. That's a quick start. All right, well, it looks... And, and this time, I'm going to finish my assignment and I'll give you a hint at what it's going to be. Ooh. Are you ready? Yeah, I'm, I'm dying to know. This is pod racing. Wait, what? Tell me more. Okay, pod racing. You had me at pod racing. Um, what are you making here? I don't know yet, but it's going to be amazing. And if you beat the pod racing, you're going to see the most important character in all of the Star Wars universe. Oh, I think I know. I think I know who that might be. It's C-3PO. <laughs> Ah, that's right. Of course it is. That beautiful, shiny bastard. Or I might I might try to do one of those advent of code things. Um, yeah, we, we'll figure that out. But Yeah, maybe we can both do a couple in a few of these languages, and they can serve as a um, just a simple little translation of stuff and uh, see how different techniques exist. Really, actually, if we're smart, you know what we should do? We should do the same thing every week. Yeah, you're right. We probably should. Just pick the same stuff, and we'll implement it in all the languages we try. All the languages. So I'll just pick something from the advent, you pick something from the advent and we'll just keep it consistent. Okay, that sounds great. Ooh, I'm getting excited already. I guess that means we should probably wrap it up. We both have new languages to install. That's right. That's going to be it for today's episode of Coda Radio. If you'd like links to everything we talked about, well, just go to the show notes. That's coder.show slash 360. 
over at coder.show slash contact, you can find all the ways to get in touch. We love your feedback. You can send us an email that way. You can head on over to our subreddit. Or you can find us both on Twitter. I'm at Wes Payne. And Mr. Dominic, you're... At Dumanuko. The whole network is there, too, at Jupiter Signal. If you follow them, that's a great way to stay in touch with all the new shows that we release and find out when we're live. Another method for that is jupiterbroadcasting.com slash calendar. We're here almost every single week, right around noon Pacific. And the app will convert it to you in whatever time zone you happen to prefer. Thank you all for joining us. We'll see you right here next week. <laughs>